right about that hymn. This is not part of the sermon. Um, but that hymn was written by a woman by the name of Fanny Crosby. Now, Fanny lived, I think it said, in the 1800s. And she is buried down in Bridgeport at um, Mount, not Mount Auburn, Mountain Grove Cemetery down in Bridgeport, next to P.T. Barnum, actually, not too far from P.T. Barnum and Tom Thumb. And Fanny, in her lifetime, wrote 9,000 plus hymns. Mm hmm. 9,000 hymns. And she was blind. Wow. Now, she was not born blind, she was born sighted. But very soon after, she got ill and she became blind. So she wrote all of these hymns as a blind woman. And someone, somewhere along the way, asked her if she, you know, wished that she had her sight. And she said, no, because I never would have been able to see my Jesus. Oh. Isn't that something? Wow. I know. Kind of gets you. Anyway, that's for free. <laughs> <laughs> that was a freebie. <laughs> Um, okay, so it is listed in the bulletin as the gospel, but it is actually not the gospel that we're hearing today. We're hearing a book um, from Ephesians. And round and round and round he goes, and where he stops, nobody knows. That's what I think of when I read the Pauline letters, okay, the epistle, or letter to the people of Ephesus may have been written by Paul, but most likely not. But name, make no mistake, the content of this epistle is very Pauline. And so the style, which is very verbose and circuitous, drives home the point of the Christian faith. That is the agency of Christ for our salvation and God's initiative in the whole thing. So I'll share with you now a reading of scripture this morning from the epistle of the Ephesians, the first chapter. And I will be reading from the inclusive Bible. It's very similar to what's printed, I guess, on the screen. Uh, it's not in the bulletin. Um, it's a little bit different, but I think you can follow along. Praise be the maker of our savior, Jesus Christ, who has bestowed on us in Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Before the world began, God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless and to be full of love. God likewise predestined us through Christ Jesus to be adopted children. Such was God's pleasure and will that everyone might praise the glory of God's grace which was freely bestowed on us in God's beloved Jesus Christ. It is in Christ and through the blood of Christ that we have been redeemed and our sins forgiven. So immeasurable, generous is God's favor given to us with perfect wisdom and understanding. God has taken pleasure in revealing the mystery of the plan through Christ to be carried out in the fullness of time, namely, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together in Christ. In Christ, we were willed an inheritance. For in the decree of God, and everything is administered according to the di divine will and counsel, we were predestined to praise the glory of the Most High by being the first to hope in Christ. In Christ, you too were chosen. When you heard the good news of salvation, the word of truth, and believed in it, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the pledge of our inheritance, the deposit paid against the full redemption of a people who are God's own to the praise of God's glory. So you got it? It's all clear, right? <laughs> yeah, I see your heads bobbling out there. <laughs> As I said, it's verbose, 
like whoa, and circuitous. It just kind of goes round and round, and it really seems to define this passage written in Paul's style. Let's just put it in plain words. It's thick, right? It's really thick. As I said, it goes round and round and round with Christ-centered theology. In brief, this passage speaks of spiritual blessings that are abundant in this, in, in this passage, but it also speaks of being chosen as God's children, divine grace, redemption, God's purposes, and unity, all through Christ. But what we have to remember is way back in the first century, Ephesus, culture, politics, and religion were all mixed together. There was no separation of church and state back then. They were all one. So Paul had established the church amid a culture of Greco-Roman religion that worshipped the goddess Diana, goddess of wild animals in the hunt. And additionally, Paul's audience was largely Gentile over and against the Jews of the day. And we know Paul was rigid, very rigid in his understanding of Christ and salvation. You know, there's nothing black and white. If you read any of the Pauline letters or, um, you know, the New Testament, there's nothing black and white about his understanding of the growing Christian theology, theology and doctrine that was to come. The problem that occurred was that Paul's Christianity refused synchronicity or a blending with anything other than Christianity. Hence, the strong theological stance in this letter written to kind of shore up the early church, you know, to give them a boost. To say, hey, you guys, you can do this. Remain faithful to the gospel. Now, a lot has been written about this particular passage and the idea of predestination, which it certainly points to, especially with verses like, In Christ, God accomplished all things accordance with the divine will. And there are other passages that lead to that, too. But for today, I'm not arguing a point here for or against predestination. Too many scholars have done that from the beginning of organized Christianity. So I don't want this sermon to be debatable in terms of who's in and who's not and what you have to do and what you don't have to do to be a part of the in crowd that has done far too much damage and has caused detriment and harm to others. Ephesians reminds us of God's love for us. It truly is about inclusion. It's at God's initiative, God's initiative, that we are loved, that we are all loved. With our contemporary cultural awareness and maturity, we've come so far from this initial understanding of Scripture and the times in which it was written. We, as Christians, are blessed and loved. Yes, without a doubt. It's through Christ's redemptive act that we can, that we can claim that. But we also know that for others, there could be a different path. All other people, in fact, receive God's special blessing and love, too. This is shown to us in the story of the Magi. The three kings are the astronomers who come from the east to find the baby Jesus, as shown, you know, through the Epiphany star. They, too, are now part of the blessing. That's the beauty of Three Kings Sunday. They were not Jews. They were Gentiles. 
who came to worship the newborn king. So this is the first instance in the New Testament where God reveals Jesus Christ to others, right? to the Gentiles. That's the beauty, I think, of the blessing of um, January 6th, Epiphany. God's love expands way beyond our human imaginations. American nun, scholar, and professor at Union Theological Seminary, Mary C. Boys, in her book, Has God Only One Blessing?, examines the notion of covenant in terms of the Hebrew Bible covenant between God and the Hebrew people and the New Testament covenant in Jesus where Gentiles also receive blessing and covenant with God. The Christian covenant could not have come into being without the Jewish covenant. She wonders how we, as Christians, can understand ourselves in the context of Judaism or other religious affiliations as well. We're all interconnected. We're not separate. A seminary professor of mine once asked, how do we know that God doesn't have a zillion covenants out there? The fact is, we don't, right? We don't know how many covenants God has. Maybe God has two zillion covenants out there. We just don't know. So the question then becomes for us, how can we live together in our common humanity amidst the vast sea of religious and non-religious differences? How can we remain true to our faith while honoring other faith constructs? Now, as you know, I mentioned it, or it's in my bio somewhere along the way, I think you know this, for four years, uh, I was a part-time chaplain at the VA in West Haven, while I was also serving the church in Orange. And while I was specifically the Protestant chaplain, we had a Jewish chaplain, Protestant chaplain, and we had two Catholic priests, um, I served more as an interfaith chaplain. We all did. Right? We all did. Because the vets that I ministered to at bedside or uh, in groups were from many different faith traditions and none at all. And in that time, I heard a whole lot of stories about a whole lot of different things. But I did hear a lot of individual faith stories, their journeys. Many vets told me when and where their faith grew stronger. The older ones in Vietnam. And some told me when and why their faith ceased. Also Vietnam. Some belief systems were so far beyond my understanding and thinking that all I could do was just stand there and wonder, you know, what was I possibly hearing? And then, of course, there were Christians who were so staunch in their faith that it made me look like a pagan. You know, it's always easy. It's so easy to affirm those whose faith lives were and are vibrant, right, and life-giving, and especially those whose faith, beliefs, and understanding of this world were very similar to mine. It required much more effort, though, to listen and to affirm someone different from me, someone who worshipped differently and understood God as something far different than I did. And yet, as a chaplain, that's what I was called to do. I was called to affirm and love the individual before me as we communicated, acknowledging our differences, knowing that we might never agree. And you know what? It's okay. I don't need to win. 
I just need to be true to my faith and firm in what I believe to be true for me. And it's here, at that place, where then I can enter into dialogue with others. It was the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu who said, Differences are not intended to separate, to alienate. We are different precisely in order to realize our need of one another. And we do need one another. It takes finesse, openness, a commitment to be who you are and a willingness to listen without judgment or the need to correct or, you know, best someone. We're all in this life game together. We're just trying to make a difference, just trying to live our lives. Valerie Carr is a Sikh American. She's a civil rights activist, lawyer, filmmaker, and founder of the Revolutionary Love Project. She was at an annual meeting of the Historic Connecticut Conference about three years ago, and I got to hear her speak in her book. She spoke about her book entitled See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love. Now, she was very moving, very inspirational, and she offered concrete ways to affect revolutionary love. It was her grandfather who taught her the tenets of the Sikh faith, which was based on the teaching of Guru Nanak, who taught his followers to see no stranger. She notes, revolutionary love is the choice to enter into wonder and labor for others, for our opponents and for ourselves in order to transform the world around us. It is not a formal code or prescription, but an orientation to life that this personal and political, that is personal, political, and rooted in joy. Loving only ourselves is escapism. Loving only our opponents is self-loathing. Loving only others is ineffective. All three practices together make love revolutionary. And revolu revolutionary love can only be practiced in community. Knowing that God loves your neighbor does not lessen God's love for you. And knowing that God loves you does not exclude God's love for anyone else. With this knowledge, we need not be selfish or possessive about our way and our truth. God's blessings are for everyone to relish in. Rooted in joy, as Carr says, is where we can begin to love our neighbors different. And joy is not giddy. It's not a cute emoji. A hearty belly laugh that makes tears roll down your cheeks, or not balloons that make us happy. Joy is a way of life. A way of looking at life realistically and still being able to affirm that life is good that you are in a good place and really need for nothing. If we're rooted in joy, then we can enter into community and to love. And that love, the love that is willing to roll up its sleeves and wrestle in the dirt, have late night conversations over coffee. Listen to every word being spoken and unspoken. Well, that is the love that can bring about justice and peace in this world. So simple. So revolutionary. 
And may the blessing of this epiphany season be with you and in you so that your light mingles with the light of God and shines the path for you alongside all people. Amen. <laughs>